All right, Hotep. Hotep. Put your hands yeah. together. We live. We around the world now. We represent the Institute around the world right now. Live from the Malefe K35 Germantown Avenue in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And we are on the move with the right information. There's conscious people around the world. And your brothers and sisters in Philadelphia, on behalf of Malefe K35 Institute, you know, we greet you in peace and we say Hotep. Hotep. Because some people's attention span, you know, isn't what others are. So if it's your first time getting this kind of information, we want to keep the party going. The namesake of the Institute, the great Dr. Malefe Kete Asante, put your hands together. Author of over 80 books. The chair of the Department of Agriculture and African American Studies at Temple University. And the first in the world to have a PhD in Agriculture and African American Studies. Show your love. Wow, man. That brother is powerful. You know, he's dynamite. I, I, I love him and I love his spirit and his, his energy. And they, 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 they told me already that uh, earlier this morning that he just really turned the place out. I mean, that's, that's him. Uh, Dr. Aaron Smith, delighted young brother with great power, with a great sense of understanding and sensitivity to our history and culture. I just want to thank all of you for coming. People have come as far away as Washington today. And I'm really happy to, to see you. And uh, the more people are coming, and, and that's good. Because the topic that we have to talk about tonight uh, is a very important topic. And it's one that, to me, is at the center of a lot of the discourse that we have had in the world. And most people sometimes uh, think that these kinds of discussions are not necessary. But these are the discussions that create the context and the, uh, the, uh, the situations that we, we find ourselves in. If we don't get this right in terms of our history and our culture, then everything else is out of alignment. And that's basically what we have seen throughout the world. So I am I'm happy, I'm, I'm, I'm honored, first of all, to be able to be here. Um, I've just come from uh, the continent of Africa. Uh, I can tell you that it is uh, rich and uh, powerful and that the continent is beautiful, uh, that our brothers and sisters on the continent, uh, particularly the Nubian people in Upper Egypt, are doing uh, as best as they can. They, uh, they're teaching their children. Uh, they're learning, certainly, their ancient culture and history uh, at home. I, I was very uh, stunned, however, to find that one of my great friends, Brother Hamdi, uh, in Elephantine, had passed away two years ago. And uh, so I was fortunate to be able to go to his home and to meet uh, his uh, mother-in-law and also uh, his son, uh, Brother Abdul. So it was really nice. Brother Hamdi was my teacher uh, in Elephantine uh, about 20 uh, 25 years ago, when I first started going to Kemet, I, I, I went looking for the black people. That, that's the thing I, I went looking for. I said, Cairo can't be uh, all there is to ancient Kemet, because the people who live in Cairo uh, have not been, were not in ancient Kemet. Most people get confused. They think those people were in ancient Kemet. They were not in ancient Kemet. They came to Africa in the seventh century. Uh, this era, not, not even 7th century B.C., 7th century this side, you see. So uh, when you understand that, then you can understand why it took so long for certain things to happen with our ancient culture in, in, in Kemet and in, uh, in, in Nubia. Uh, actually, uh, it was like around the 19th century, in the 1800s, that we began to get some interest in preservation of Nile Valley civilization, even though the Arabs had already been there since the seventh century. And they, they had no interest in that preservation. It was the Europeans who saw it and saw a way to try to capitalize on it and make Europe greater in the minds of the world by achieving uh, the appropriation of African traditions and African culture and African history. So Europeans saw that in the, in the 19th century, I mean, after Champollion, 
um, had uh, succeeded in deciphering the ancient language, uh, then Europeans just poured into uh, Egypt. Uh, they, they were not trained. There were no trained <laughs> these, Some of these guys were thieves. That's right. They were, you know, they were just looking for what they could sell. They wanted any any fragment of of Kemet. They could take it and sell it to a museum in Chicago or Berlin or Paris or something. They they were thieves, and these thieves who came into Africa uh, and into uh, Egypt and the Nile Valley later uh, became known as Egyptologists. Mm -hmm. they, they, they became the scholars. These, these thieves, the guys who, who were looking for as much as they could of the ancient African civilization, no, no, no these were not uh, scholars, they were not trained university people. Most of them were just adventurers. And these adventurers, some of them were administrators, pol political administrators, uh, like Salt or uh, Trevadi. I mean, uh, the, the, these guys, they, they, they were just scavengers, in a sense, in terms of African history and culture. But they started in the 19th century trying to preserve as much as they could or take as much as they could and take it to the museums. And the Arabs had been there, as I said, uh, by that time uh, for about 1,200 years. And they did never, they, they didn't have that interest, the same kind of interest. Uh, in Nothing to do with uh, Islam and with uh, with with their culture, and so they want they shouldn't. Why should be, black people be going to the Nile Valley looking at the temples and and looking at the pyramids and so on? This is pagan and so forth. So you got you got those attitudes, and those attitudes are rampant, not just among Arab people, but among African people, African people who have no knowledge of their own history and culture who basically despise their ancestors, mm -hmm. who basically can never understand the depth of the philosophy and the strength of the interpretations that our people gave to the world. So that's why I say to you that this uh, topic, ancient Nubia, a key to understanding African religion, is, is one of the topics that I've often wanted to discuss and to, to deal with because I think it is key. If we can understand that, if we can appreciate that, uh, we will understand what some key propositions are in the world, some key propositions about Europe. And one of them is that all European analysis, uh, whatever the analysis is, of Nubia and Kemet, all of those analyses, have, have been done under the veil of racism. Mm -hmm. Now you gotta remember that, because if you don't know that, again, we're lost. Everything, they, they, whatever. Let me just tell you this, just a little bit. Before Champollion uh, had succeeded in deciphering the ancient language of Kemet, the uh, white people had all kinds of fanciful, Europeans had all kinds of fanciful uh, descriptions of what the ancient language said. And most of that fanciful language that they, uh, they say, you know, they would look at the uh, so-called hieroglyphics. We don't like to use the word hieroglyphics, which means sacred carvings. It's a Greek word. Uh, we, we say chikam, or the language of Kemet, or either we say metonetia, which is a description, which means the divine word. Uh, but uh, they looked at the uh, chikam, and when they looked at the Chikam, they, they, just, they just made up uh, interpretations that benefited Europe. You know, it's like, it's like you know, you say, oh, this, what they were saying here is glory to the white man. So all kinds of crazy stuff. They just made it up. 
And when Champollion in 1822 finally came with a, to, to decipher the language, that's how we began to, uh, to, to recover the language, because the language had been out of, out of um, let's put it this way, it had been lost, so to speak, uh, since the 6th century, um, uh, since the 6th century. And that's when the Christians closed down the last temple uh, in, in Nubia. And they closed down the last temple in Nubia uh, in uh, around 575. And this was the temple of Pajurk. Uh, Pajurk, uh, which is called uh, in the Greek language, Philae. They closed that down in 575. And then after that, Nobody was supposed to speak the ancient Egyptian language anymore. You, you couldn't speak. And it was preserved by a, a small group of people called Coptic Christians. They preserved a little bit of it, and it's sort of like an a, a ancient dialect of it, but it's not the full uh, Chicam. So, uh, but, the, but the point that I'm making here about this is that to understand uh, what has been written about ancient uh, Nubia you got to understand it in the light that the Europeans were always trying to discover Europe in Africa. This is why they even claimed, they claimed that ancient Egyptians were not Africans. Then they, then they claimed that the Nubians, they were claiming the Nubians were not Africans. Then they claimed that the Ethiopians are not Africans. So then you start looking around, well, where are the Africans? Who, this is we in Africa. This is the continent of Africa. The Nile River runs through only one continent in the world. It doesn't run through Europe. The Nile River runs through the continent of Africa. 4,100 miles through the continent of Africa. Never touches Europe. Never touches Asia. Never touches South America. And some of you Americans may think it touches North America, but it doesn't. Nile River is an African river. So this notion, somehow, that uh, uh, you can find uh, Europe in Nubia, or Europe and Kemet, was a notion that came out of racism because they could not figure out how was it possible that the people they had colonized, that they had oppressed, that they had enslaved, that these people could build the civilizations of the Nile Valley. So remember that. Everything you read, everything you read about Egypt or about Nubia that's written by Europeans, particularly in the 19th and 20th century, you, you, to be wise and to not be fooled, you better ask yourself the question, where is the racism in this? That's the, only, that's the question you gotta ask, you gotta ask. If you don't ask that question, you will definitely be fooled. All right, now the second proposition is, most Europeans have tried to find the European entry into Nubia. So they said, okay, well if the Nubians were not uh, we're, we're not uh, uh, Europeans, then actually Nubia itself is just a corridor into Africa. It's not Africa, it's the corridor into Africa. Wait a minute. That's just like saying California is not United States. California is just a corridor, you know, in North America. This is not, this is a stupid kind of thinking. Uh, Nubia is, is Africa. Nubia is a part of Africa. It's not a part of anywhere else. It is not. But Europe had to do that to try to, because they were trying to claim at one point that Egypt was Europe. You see? So now, if Egypt is Europe, then Nubia has to be a corridor to Africa because Africa was something else in their mind. We don't even know what they meant when they were saying Africa was something else in their mind. You, you know, it's a very strange thing what Europe tried to do because there's no one uh, way that Africans look. There's no one, one uh, type of African people. Africa is the most diverse continent on the face of the earth. There are 3,000 languages spoken on the continent of Africa. This is almost half of all the languages spoken in the world. Africa is diverse. There are all kinds of people. Look all kinds of ways in Africa. There's no one way that African people look. I mean, you can't make you no know, argument like that. Like, like somehow this is, this is not Africa, but there's a corridor to Africa. You can go to the tip of uh, uh, South Africa and you can find the Khoi people. 
and, and the court people uh, are about the same complexion as the people of Morocco. So you, you, how, you can't even go by color. You, you can't go by hair. You can't get none of that. You, you can't even go by nose, <laughs> you know? You can't go by Africa, come on. You can just look at this room and see the diversity of African people. We, we're diverse people. We, we are, in a sense, the quintessential human beings in the sense that we have all types of people, all types of looks, all types of hair and complexion and eye color among African people. That's the African people. So the continent of Africa has given birth to all of this. So that's, that's the second proposition. The third proposition is that Nubia, Ethiopia, and in many, some people have argued that you can put those two together. But there's another argument. We can talk about that later. That Nubia, Ethiopia, uh, really is the mother of Kemet. Because, you know, we like, we like to talk about Kemet. I love Kemet. I, 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 um, I was just talking to Dr. Maulana Karinga yesterday, and I was telling him about following the uh, Chicago uh, 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 correspondence course on, um, on uh, uh, Metternetia, on, on Chikam. And uh, we were just talking about it, and I said, we like to talk about Kemet because we have more evidence. You know, Kemet left so many records. That's why we know so much about it. Mm -hmm. And so we say we start with Kemet, and we also start with it because writing starts with uh, Kemet. The first writing in the world is the writing that the a African people in Kemet uh, did. Uh, writing even in Mesopotamia doesn't come to 500 to 800 years later than writing comes in Africa. This is the first writing. And not only writing as we know it, but if you take even the scripts and you take uh, symbols, uh, the writing on the caves, the cave writing. Africa has hundreds of thousands of cave paintings and cave writings. I've seen many of them. Zimbabwe, for example, you can, you can go all over the country and just see, go to these cave, one cave after other, and saw where human beings, African human beings, had, 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 had put symbols of animals and people and birds on caves. This is all over. So, so Africans have been doing this for thousands of years even before what we call history. You remember, history, they say, starts with writing. Before writing, they call it prehistory. This is the, uh, you know, one of the conventions that Europe made. So, so if, if it's not, you don't have writing, then it's prehistory. If you have writing, it's history. So when you look at history, then Kemet looms large because there's a lot of writing about Kemet, a lot of information about Kemet. And uh, in fact, we have more information about Kemet than we have about Nubia. But yet, let me tell you something, Nubia has yet to be discovered fully. And not only that, but the attempt on, on, you, on Nubia is to destroy all evidences of African civilization. And that's been going on longer, longer than we can even imagine. The whole idea, because let me just tell y'all something. This, this, I'm, I'm, you know that you, you, most of y'all here at the MKA Institute, y'all know this, but a lot of people in the world don't know. There are more temples, pyramid temple type temples, in Nubia than in Egypt, in Kemet. Did y'all know that? Oh, of course, y'all know. Y'all here at the Institute. Y'all hear, hear Dr. Aaron all the time. Okay, so, but, so, so it's important. To know this, because otherwise you, you, you get a wrong impression of what African history is. That in what is today Sudan, and remember, we, these boundaries that we have now, these are, these are, this is fake news. <laughs> this is, these, are, these, are, these are fake boundaries. Who, who, who set the boundary? Uh, you know, uh, right here at Abu Simbel, just a few miles south of Abu Simbel, then we're going to say this is no longer, this, this, is, this is Sudan, that's Egypt, and all that kind of thing. That's, we, it, it th uh, uh, three, four thousand years ago, our, our people set those kind of, no, these are modern borders. These are more, you can't even go by that. You can't even say, like we say, you know, we, we say, well, you know, uh, Nubia is now a part of Sudan and a part of 
Egypt. States of America in the eighth grade, where is Egypt and where is Sudan? They say, well, they think it's in Europe. They even think Nubia is in Europe because they think of the civilization, you see, and so forth. And that's why they think of it. But brothers and sisters, let me tell you something that they discovered in Sudan, in the Nubian area at Kusto, an incense burner. An incense burner. Now, this incense burner is like almost 5,000 years old. This is a, this is like, it's like something where you, you know, you, you burn, you put a piece of incense in and you burn it and you make, you, now you we have stick incense, but they used to just have, you know, the, the little stone incense you, you, and, and they burn. This incense burner was discovered to be uh, found 3,200 years before Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ wasn't even thought about. Nobody was thinking about him. 30, nobody was thinking about Muhammad. 3,200 years B.C. in Nubia, they have at Custom an incense burner. Now, let me tell you what's on the incense burner. There's a picture of a cat. There's a picture of an antelope. There's a picture of a ruler like a king. The, the, the king is wearing a white crown, the white crown of Nubia and Upper Egypt. And then there's a, a prisoner, and then there's a facade of a palace. You say kneeling now? Kneeling. Like Kaepernick? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> kneeling, right? kneeling. Just like Kaepernick. Right. You see what I'm saying? I'm, I'm getting to be, I'm getting to be hip hop. <laughs> I'm hanging around the hip hop man, right? You can put all that stuff together. I mean, no, it's, it's, it's all it's a very fascinating thing. But the but the facade, the palace facade, is so key because they carved a palace fa facade of a of a king's palace, and that had never been done in history. Nobody had ever seen that. Neither in Africa or Asia or Europe, nowhere. The first palace facade that was ever carved on anything was when the Africans carved the palace facade of a royal member of a family on the Kustal incense burner. That's the first thing. Now let me tell you something else. I, I don't want to get into this too deeply, but uh, that's a general map of um, Sudan. You can't quite see that so much, but uh, if you look at the first part, uh, the top part, it looks like it's white, all that area in there. Well, this was the area of, of Nubia. But you know what they do in the map of Sudan? They say this is the area of the Arabs and the Nubians. They, 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 what, because what happened was that when the conquest happened, they took over that northern part of Sudan, for the most part administratively and basically marginalized the original people. The original people of that land were the Nubian people. And not only did they marginalize the Nubian people, but over the centuries, they have done many, many things. Because one of the last Christian uh, kingdoms in uh, northern Africa was in Nubia. And, and, and this is uh, Nobatia and uh, Nobatia and uh, uh, Dongola. I mean, these were, these were, these were, this, it was even 16 or 1700s before the Muslims finally destroyed that whole part of Nubia. And then they took over that part and then claimed that there are no Nubians here. There are no black people here. They never were any black people here. In fact, if you go right now and you go to that northern part of Sudan, one of the things in the, in the southern part of Egypt, it's the same thing. One of the things they try to do is get rid of the black people. 
And you know what brother told me just recently, an elephant team? He said, we ain't going nowhere. We ain't going nowhere. They want to get rid of us? We ain't going nowhere. We're going to be here. We, we're ready. This, this is where our ancestors were born, where they live, where they work. We are not going anywhere. Because you know what happened in southern Egypt and in northern Sudan was that in the 1960s and 70s, they had a vast uh, removal of African people. They, they, removed, they removed the people. And when they built the Aswan High Dam in around 1970, what that dam did was a flood a huge part of the antiquities of Nubia. We, we don't even know. And, this, and you know what's so, so shameful in a way, but, but I can understand it. I mean, I try to explain it. <laughs> you know, it, for us as African people, we don't even know what we lost. We didn't even know we were losing. That in effect, what they did was to destroy African villages and monuments and temples and shrines and bury them under Lake Nasser. That's what they did. This is, what else can they be but cultural bandits? So the African, so, so we, have a, we have a problem even in interpreting Nubia because so much of Nubia has been lost. And yet what was not lost is still in Sudan, but the Sudanese government doesn't seem to know how to preserve it. You can go to preserve for tourism. Go for tourism. We go down and, and see, and, and you know, you, you go, as, as we've just, with 24 people, we just came back. Dr. Gaffin and I, we did 24 people. Went with us. Go into the temples, down in the tombs, see all the paintings on the black people on the walls, and listen to the white people say, I wonder why I touch black. <laughs> he said, because he was. You know what I mean? Why, why, why you wonder, you know? It's all kinds of crazy stuff. You go into the museum, uh, Cairo even, and you see, you see all the hair, the wigs, the, the afros. Where do these afros come from? Because the people, this is the people's hair, you know what I'm saying? So anyway, the, the, this is a, this is, so we got a big problem. And this problem is amazing because look at the acres of pyramids that you would, you would find in Nubia right today. The acres of pyramids. These pyramids, and, and the, the pyramids, uh, granite, in Kemet are older, uh, you know, but th there are not as many. There are over 200 pyramids in Sudan. And these 200 pyramids, I'm telling you that very few of them are under full reconstruction, like the ones in Egypt have been under for years. The different uh, uh, governments of Germany and France and United States universities like Chicago and uh, uh, these universities going in and say, we're going to restore this. There is also the ASA uh, uh, restoration project that Tony Browder is working uh, with the, the Russian uh, scholar Pistakova. Uh, th they're working to uh, actually restore the tomb of Karakamu. Mm -hmm. so, so, so that's going on. We went there. We saw that work going on. So, so that's, that's, and that's the only example that I know, and there may be others. Uh, I even, uh, there was a brother who went with us from South Africa, uh, Dr. Sisanti, and uh, he couldn't think of any others, but I couldn't think of any other black uh, group that is working in, uh, say, in southern Egypt uh, doing archaeology. The only one I know of is this one that is really a joint project uh, between uh, this Russian woman, Elena Pistakova, and uh, Anthony Browder. That's the only one I know. So, so it's very fascinating how the story of Africa is being positioned and how it's being told. 
because it's not being told from an Afrocentric point of view. It's rare. And so that's why we have to do it. So uh, shake out the joke. In 1980, he's reading one of my books. And uh, this is a little book I, I gave to him and went by to see him at his office in Dhaka. And I just put his picture here because he's important. He's dead now, he died in 86, but he was, a, he was one of our great scholars and he was the one who pointed us to the Nile Valley civilization because his argument was that civilization in the world starts with the Nile Valley. Nowhere else. This is fundamental. All right. So Nubia, from Aswan to Meroe. Uh, most people have never heard of Jebel Barkow. And in fact, that's not its ancient African name. That's the name that the that we get from the Arabic, Jebel Barkal, meaning holy mountain, uh, which overlooks the ancient city of Napata, which was a great city from which the conquering dynasty, 25th dynasty, that actually conquered the Nile Valley uh, from uh, Nubia all the way to the Mediterranean Sea, they, they'd come. This was one of their main cities, the city of Napata. But Jebel Barkal, is one of the great religious sites in the world. It is larger than any other site that I can think of except Karnak, the temple at Karnak. It is basically, some people used to call it the southern Ipat Sut. Uh, Ipat Sut was the ancient name of that great temple uh, in Karnak, and, and what it's called, we call it now Karnak, that's the, the Arab uh, term, but uh, the Africans call it Ipat Sut. Ipet Sut, the, the great holy site in Waset, which today is called, this is, they change the names on you, confusion. The, 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 the name, the, what, what's the name of Waset today? Anybody? Luxor. Luxor. See, they didn't change it to Luxor. The, the, the Arabs changed it to Luxor. But, it, but the Greeks had another name for it. Thebes. So, so, you got, so you got the African name of the city was Waset. The Greeks, when they ruled, they changed it to Thebes, and the Arabs, when they came to power, called it Luxor. But the ancient Africans in Waset called the temple Ipet Sut. And so this sacred of sacreds, this sacred place, had, a, a, in a sense, a twin, which was in the south, called, uh, which we call now Jebel Barkal. And both of these temples, these were major temples, you see. So uh, Thutmose III, uh, the great conquering king, the greatest conqueror in the history of the world. No conqueror. And remember this. African people start thinking and reading and writing and learning and understanding the world. No conqueror in the world was as great as Thutmose III. Thutmose III, 17 military campaigns that he led personally into battle and came back alive. No other king ever did that. Closest we get is Alexander the Greek, who did seven. 17 times, Thutmose III. So in 1450, He's, he's, he's in, uh, he's in uh, Nubia, and he links Jebel Barkal to Waset, to these Napata, uh, and also Waset. These are the great cities of the kingdom. And there's a book by Miriam Maat Kare Monghez. She was the first African-American that I know of who ever wrote a book about Kush itself, Nubia itself. And her book is called uh, 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 Kush, the Jewel of Nubia. And this book was based on her dissertation. She was the first, first black American that I know of to take this on. She said, we've got to reclaim Kush. We reclaim Kemet, but we've got to reclaim Kush. So if you get a chance, that book is still on Amazon.com. Kush, the Jewel of Nubia. Now, other map, I just want to show you this little map quickly of Sudan so that you can see, uh, the, you can see at the bottom here, you can see um, actually Abu Simbel. You can see Abu Simbel uh, at the bottom of Egypt, and then you can see Wadi Hafa, and then you can see also that lake, Lake Nasser, which uh, is uh, 
uh, I think the Lake Nubia in uh, Sudan. If I'm wrong, I think I got uh, some Sudanese in the audience who could correct me, but I think it's called Lake Nubia. But I know it's Lake Nasser in, in Egypt, right? And, and Nasser was the leader of Egypt that built the high dam that caused this, but it flooded lots of things. Now, where I'm getting to in a minute, you will see where we have the key to understanding uh, African religion, but, but, but I just wanted you to remember, just look at this map and see the northern part there, and you can see uh, the larger part coming from uh, Egypt into uh, Sudan where you have, it looks like the river gets larger. It's, it's, it's a massive lake, one of the largest lakes, maybe the largest man-made lake in the world is that lake, Lake Nasa, Lake Nubia, okay? Um, it's more than 250 miles long, it's massive, and it destroyed so much of Nubian civilization. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, uh, we say that it's possible that the oldest monument ever made by human beings was uh, Heru M. Aket. This is called Har M. Aket by some people, meaning Horus or uh, Heru, Horus, uh, Horus of the horizon. This was the Sphinx. The Greeks call it Sphinx. That was not an African word. It was, we call it uh, Heru M. Aket. Now, Heru M. Aket uh, is a face of an African man with the body of a lion. And uh, some people think it was built uh, in the Old Kingdom, uh, maybe in uh, 20, 26, 25 uh, BC. But there are other people uh, who think that it was built maybe even longer than that, 14,000 years old. And I just give that to you as an example. There's some things I'm giving as an example so you can understand. Four Nubian temples, not, and, and uh, Sphinx is not in Nubia. Uh, Sphinx is in Kemet. But four Nubian temples were given to Europe by the Egyptian government in the 1960s and 70s. And look at this now. You probably never heard of some of these temples. The Temple of Tafa was given to the Netherlands. And it's in Leiden right now. If you were in Leiden and you're listening to me, you can go to the museum and you can see it. Uh, the Temple of Lissa was given uh, by uh, was given to Italy and it's in Turin. You can go and see it. And it was built by Tutmosis <coughs> III. The temple of Dabu was given to Spain and the royal palace of Madrid. That's where it's now. This is just a few of them. And then uh, the gates of Calapsia was given to the Berlin Museum and then in New York City, right now. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, those of you in Harlem and Brooklyn and Manhattan, you know, other parts of New York, you can go right now and see the Temple of Dender that's in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. It was given by Egypt to New York City and America. Mm. Did you think they asked the Nubians? The Arab government of Egypt asked the Nubians, do you want us to give your temples away? You want us to give, I mean, what, what do you want us to do with this? They never had a thought. They never thought about it. They never, there was nothing ever in the mind of the government that really went and asked the people of Nubia about this. In fact, what they did was they removed, they moved the Nubian people. Mm -hmm. They moved them, literally. Some people, they moved 800 miles away from where they were. They moved, they moved them to the desert. So, let, you remember this. Y'all got to remember this. The Nubians are not desert people. For the most part, the Nubians are river people. They lived along the Nile. That's their civilization. The Nile civilization. That's the, that's the new. And so what did the, what did the uh, government do? They moved them to the desert. That's not only cruel. 
that just shows you how little they understand about our history and culture, you see? So I, I'm telling you about these temples because I want you to look, Temple of Dabu. Not, 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 not in, you know, they, they moved it. Look at this. The ancient names of God. Now let's go back to the ancient names of God. We know that Ra was used in Aonu. Aonu. Remember that name, Aonu. Sometimes you call it, sometimes people just call it On, O-N. Because you, you, when you're looking at the uh, script, uh, the name of the city, you, you can make own, you can make Aonu um, out of it. Uh, so, uh, but what the Greeks did, they made Heliopolis out of it. <laughs> they, they just call it Heliopolis. They say, this is Aonu, we, we don't want to say that. Let's just say Heliopolis. Because Ra was the god uh, that was like the sun, was as massive and, and, and comprehensive as the sun. So, it's, so they said, Ra, since Ra is a sun god, uh, this is the city of Heliopolis, city of the sun. But the Africans call it Aonu, all right? That's the city of, that's the city where Ra, that's the city of Ra. Amen was the god, the deity for Waset which was one of the greatest cities ever in the history of the world. And Ptah was the name of the deity for Menefer. Menefer used to be called by the Greeks Memphis. That's where you get Memphis, Tennessee from. And you know, if the white people knew that the word Memphis, Tennessee came from Africa, them white people down there near Mississippi and Memphis, they would be shocked. That their, that their name, Memphis, is actually an Afri come from an African word. Menefer, you see? This is the, that's, that's where it came. And the Greeks just took the African word and changed it to say Memphis, you see? That's what they did. A lot of, a lot of the names of African names, they, they changed like that. And then uh, the deity Atun, uh, uh, and sometimes uh, Mandulis. Uh, were worshipped at uh, Jebel Barkal. All right, next uh, slide here. Uh, now, I'm just going to just mention this. Uh, the name Amen is probably one of the oldest names for God anywhere. This is why I tell people they say Amen at the end of Christian prayers, Hebrew prayers, Muslim prayers. They say Amen. 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 Amu. Well, whatever. They just say it, right? Because it's an ancient name for God. The African name. The ancient African name for God. Amen. That, that's what it is. And so everybody want to make sure they have insurance. So that's why at the end of their prayers, they say it. Y'all say it? I know, I know. Y'all just said it today. Amen. Amen. Right? That's right. Oh, you make sure I name the, the African God because if I don't, I may be in trouble. You see? Amen. So, so Amen, this is an ancient name. And then it was a name for uh, many, the, the, some of the queens uh, of Nubia, like uh, Amanarensis. You know, Amen, and it comes from that. Uh, Amanashiketi, you see. Amen Ra. The word even in Kiswahili, Imani. Hey, it comes from God. Amen. It's the same name, same root, you see. So, so when we understand that, we understand a lot about ourselves. But uh, the temples of Nubia, I'm just going through this quickly. Uh, Philae was a temple, and I was just there last week. Uh, the, this was a temple where uh, uh, the deity Oset was worshipped, Oset, and also Heru, uh, her son, uh, Horus, as the Greeks said. Uh, then uh, Kalapsha which is also a Nubian, these are Nubian temples, uh, where Heru was worshipped. And then Abu Simbel, where Amun-Ra, Ptah, Atum, and Ramses himself were worshipped as gods. And uh, then Dindur, the one that's in New York City, uh, where all set, uh, that the Greeks call Isis, uh, was worshipped. And Padesi and Pihor, who were the sons of the local Nubian 
king, through worshiping Osa and Oset. Uh, then the temple of um, Solab. Let me just see if I. Okay, this is, this is uh, I think we pronounce that Solap. Yes. Solap. Yeah. This is the Temple of Solap. This brother right back there was born not far from there. Yeah. Brother, Raise your hand, Brother Nubatu. <laughs> brother Nubatu. That's where he was, his people. That's his old history, culture. He was born a few miles from there, right? So this is, but, but this is a, but, but I, I give you this because it's a real thing, this whole notion of uh, Nubia and the history and culture of Nubia is so rich and yet that temple at Sola is, is not as protected as it ought to be. Somebody just wrote last month that they just walked, they just drove there got out of the car, walked right up there and picked up rocks and stones <laughs> you know like, wait a minute you can't do that anywhere in Egypt in any monument but in Sudan you can because they don't give a damn about it. It's, it's not their culture. The ones who rule the country. It's the it's, it's, it's culture of the people who live there. But they don't have the power. And they don't have the international reach. To demand that people respect their history and their culture. No other people in the world have allowed their culture. To be so diminished as we African people. It's a very, very tragic thing. Then there's the Temple of Tafa. That's what it looks like in the Netherlands, you see. And uh, here's the key ideas behind the religion. Key ideas. Ma'at, Isfet, Ma'karu, Neb'ank, and ank And I'll tell you quickly what this is. Ma'at simply is order, balance, harmony. And out of that you get truth, righteousness, justice, and reciprocity. That's the basic idea of ancient Nubian religion. And the basic of, of the Kemet. This is the basic idea. It's the same. That's why it's a continuum. You, you know, people, people do some silly stuff. And I, I just had to correct a guy over in Kemet the other day because, about this. Because they do this. They, they see a, 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 they see a image on the wall of a temple, for example, with Ramses uh, defeating his enemies. And some of the enemies look like uh, black people, and some of them look like Syrians. And, uh, and they, they make a difference, they make a distinction, they say, well, you know, the ancient Egyptians, they were, these, these, uh, these uh, Nubians were not the same as the Egyptians, uh, when in fact they were the same people. It's just like, okay, the French and the Germans could be in a battle. But you don't say that they just, they're different races. They're, they're just different nations. The Nubians were a different nation than Kemet, but it was not like somehow they, these are different people and we, we got to defeat them. No, no, no. They're the same people. The Germans took over France and, and Paris during World War II. No, nobody said that they, they were a different race. They, they were a different nation. And, and they had a military strategy and so forth. So, so when we look at that, we have to always, that's why I tell you, if you look at it through racist eyes, like the Europeans who first wrote about it, that's what they said. Oh, well, these people were Africans and Egyptians didn't like them because they were black. Well, the Egyptians were black themselves. That's, not, that's a stupid kind of statement. You know, the, 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 the Germans took over the French. They didn't like them because, you know, uh, the, the Germans were white and the French were not. I mean, no, that's not that's stupid. But that's the kind of reasoning racism gives you. And Europe is good at that because Europe always wants to establish the notion of European exclusivity and European uniqueness, you see? But when they discover the Nile Valley civilizations, which are greater than a civilization of Rome and Greece combined, they don't know what to do with it. How, where do you place this kind of civilization? Where do you place 200 pyramids? 
How, how you put that in civilization and not be in Europe? They don't know how to figure that. How do you, where you put the 106 pyramids in Kemet in Egypt? How you put that? If this is, is this, if, if these things are greater, more ancient, more powerful, more majestic than anything in Greece and Rome, how do you explain it? They, that's the problem of racism, you see? And so uh, Isfet, uh, Isfet is, um, is evil and then and disorder. Makaru is a word for justified. Even in the Bible, people use the word just to be justified. This comes from ancient Africa. True of voice is what it means. Makaru, true of voice. And it was always, it was written on the temples, on the tombs, that such and such a person was true of voice, was Makaru, was justified, was aligned with truth. That's justification. That's to be justified. And then Neb Ankh. Neb Ankh was, was the so-called, you know, the Greeks call it sarcophagus. Was the, stu, the, the stone tomb. The Africans call it Neb Ankh, the Lord of Life. The Greeks call it sarcophagus, meaning flesh eater. Isn't that crazy? You go down and, you go down and do these tombs, and the God who is confused because the God is following European pattern, says, well, this sarcophagus? And I said, wait a minute, sir. Sarcophagus means flesh eater. That's not what the words say right there. They say, Neb Ankh, Lord of Life. So why don't we call it what they call it? Say, oh, that's right. That's right. This is a, yeah, yeah. Sarcophagus is not an African word. You see? And then the same is true with Ankh Nehe. Life forever. Ankh is a word means life. Ankh Nehe. The Africans were always looking for eternal life. This was before Islam, before Christianity, before Buddhism. The Africans said eternal life. And that's, that's why they buried the dead like they did. Because they knew, they felt, they believed in this notion of eternal life. All right? The gate of uh, Kalashpa, Kalasha. This is uh, right outside Aswan. You can move on. This is the temple, the same temple. This is Nubian temple. These are my Nubian brothers, right? So you got Nubian, Nubian people still in, still in Kenya. These I met about 10 years ago. But there, 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 there are others still there. Young man, young man, I just met, uh, I met him 25 years ago, but I just met him again uh, uh, last week. Still, still there, Nubian people, fighting and struggling for Nubian civilization. They won't even allow them to speak their language. They can teach it to their children. They can speak it at home, but in the streets and places, you have to speak Arabic. Now they guess their language. They don't, they don't have, so one of the things that we've decided to do at Temple, and uh, he, he's my, He's going he, to fight with me, this brother right here. Get you in trouble. <laughs> no, I'm not going to get him in yeah, trouble. I'm not going to get him in trouble. He's We're a all good in brother. trouble. We're not in trouble. No, no, but no. But one of the things we do, we're we going to have this brother right here, brother, brother Nubintu. Nubintu, stand up a little bit right here. This brother Nubintu, this brother is a scholar in the Nubian, Nubian language. We're going to have him teaching at Temple the Nubian language. Yeah. 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 Thank you, man. Thank you, brother. So, you, you know, you can, y'all can, huh? January, y'all can sign up for his class. Nubian, the first time in a university that Nubian is being taught like this. We're going to do it because we have to. It's essential. If you learn contemporary, even the contemporary Nubian, it will help you gain some access into ancient Nubian. So they're going to teach their headset? No, he's teaching in, in the temple. temple. Yes, yes, in African American studies. That's right. So look out for it. Introduction to Nubian, right? Because we already teach ancient Egypt. We teach, I wrote this course maybe in 1993 or four 
a course on um, uh, ancient Egyptian language, Middle Egyptian. We teach Middle Egyptian. Um, uh, we, we teach that. We've been teaching that for years. Uh, and the last person to teach it was Dr. Nay, who said, I'll probably teach it next year. But, but we teach that because it's essential that we know our classical languages. Because once you know the classical languages, it makes it easier for you to know a lot of other African languages. It's just like, um, you know how the Europeans learn Latin? And they learn uh, 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 Greek? They, they learn those two languages because those languages give you insight into other European languages. You, you can know something by knowing what the classical languages were. And what those, you can even make out certain words by knowing what the Latin was or what the Greek was, you see? So, okay, now uh, this is again, uh, just to show you, uh, this is the Temple of Dendur, all right? Uh, the oldest evidence of religion in Nubia goes back beyond 6,000 BC, all right? Uh, and we don't need to get into it, but all the funerary traditions and so on. Um, the whole notion of Atun uh, with water and the mound, uh, create and establish a shoe and tough nut, geb and nut, all set and all, all saw. Uh, Neb had and set. That's all that. I just want to show you this, brother, just for a mi quick minute, because as I was writing this and getting my notes together, I got word that this br great brother passed away. Mm -hmm. He he was my good friend. He's been in Philadelphia. Uh, his his daughter finished uh, uh, Temple and uh, Villanova Law School. Uh, his, his name was Atukwe Okai. Atukwe Okai was the mayor of the city of Accra in Ghana at one time. But beyond that, he was uh, one of the poets, uh, one of the great poets, the, the, the national poet of Ghana, and most people call him the greatest poet, uh, African poet. And uh, uh, Tukwo Akai introduced me to Winnie Mandela. He also was a gentleman who uh, was uh, sent to school in Moscow by uh, Kwame Nkrumah and became a, a very great poet, one of the greatest I've ever known. So I just wanted to dedicate this to him and we're gonna finish here. Uh, Jebel Barkal, the, the Holy Mountain, and I told you be, beyond that was the city of Napata. Uh, and uh, let's go to the next one. Uh, ancient Nubians invented the representation of deities in animal and human forms. This was, this was even before in, in Kemet. The, 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 the Nubians did this, all right? And uh, this is some of the pyramids. You can go, you can see this, you see? Um, and the next, we did talk about Mat, uh, Amen in Kush, the Temple of Defufa in Karma, uh, 1600 BC. And here, uh, Amen, again, the ram headed creator God is, is, is worshiped, all right? You go to the next. Uh, the principles of Nubian life. Not faith, it's not a faith tradition, but a life tradition. Mm -hmm. This is different. You see? It's not, it's not, because people say, well, what faith did they believe in? Wait a minute. No, no. It's what did they do? What was, what was a life? What did they live every day? Somebody asked me this on the trip. You know, African Americans said, Dr. Sonny, what's your religion? I said, my religion is African. They say, well, what faith is that? I say, it's African. I live, I, religion is the way you live, your life. I live like an African. I'm generous like an African. I laugh like an African. I have humor like an African. I dance like an African. I'm, I'm an African. I eat African food when I can. <laughs> no, no, you know what I mean? I'm, it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's, and I'm happy. There's, there's, a, there's a sense that, that you, people try to separate their religion from their life. Yes. But your life tells me who you are. How you are. You see? Uh, so it's not doctrine, but rituals, mm -hmm. ceremonies, mm -hmm. culture. That, that's the key. Not simply about males, but, but female presence. This is why Nubia had 42 queens. No nation in the history of the earth has ever had as many queens as Nubia. How many? Do you know? For over 42 women rule. Not, not just a husband of their, or the wife of their husband. 
They rule. Now, you, you can't do that now in Sudan. You won't find women in those positions almost nowhere in, in the world. But, but that's the way it was in ancient Nubia. Because Africans understood the principle of male and female. They were clear in that. People didn't have hang-ups. They didn't feel like they had to suppress the woman. They didn't have, that was not there, you see. Many of those temples in Nubia were built for queens, you see. All right? Respect for ecology. That's why they had the totem idea. Certain things you can't eat. Because if you ate them all, then you destroy everything. You can't, can't eat them. And you got to have respect for age groups and the age. And in the end of your life, your heart must be lighter than a feather. Mod. Your, your, your heart should be light than a feather. It, it didn't say, and what I always like to tell people this, it didn't say you have to be perfect. Say so your heart had to be lighter than a feather. Your good must outweigh your evil. That's, that's, that, that's reasonable to me. That's why I try to be good every day. You know? But I am not perfect. You know? And that's, that's, that was a fundamental difference, you see? That's the key to this. So, Ma Karu, be true of voice, your words are right, be justified. And then I give you two pictures. One at Abu Simbel. Abu Simbel. This is the Abu Simbel. Uh, if you Abu Simbel, uh, go back to Abu Simbel, please. Abu Simbel. Abu Simbel is this temple that uh, Ramses II. Usamad Ra. We always do a ritual when we go there. We did it last week. And we go. Usamad Ra, Ra, Satepin Ra. We, we, we give Usamad Ra, Satepin Ra. This is the, the, the Heru name for Ramses, you see? And we, we said, we, we, I, I, always call, I, always, I always call on it. It always shocked to the other people, like, you don't have other tourists around. And I say, Ramses, Ramses, Usamad Ra, Satan Ra, and all the Australian stuff. <laughs> what are those black people doing? So we, we talk to Ramses. We are your children. Here we are. We're back. They thought we would never come, but here we are. And he built the first temple for a woman ever built in the history of the world was a temple that Ramses built for his Nubian wife, Nefertari. This is before the Taj Mahal. Don't tell me about the Taj Mahal. I've seen the Taj Mahal. But the Taj Mahal was nothing like this. And it came far later. This, this is, this, remember, this is, this is like 1400 B.C. Of 1300 BC. 1300 BC. Taj Mahal wasn't built in the BCs. You see? It was built this era. So, so, so here's the first temple ever built by a man for a woman, and it's a black man building the temple for a black woman. Never, never, ever, and nowhere else in history. Earlier than this, that's the respect he had for Nefertari. Meaning the beautiful, the most beautiful among them all. So it's an inc incredible story. And then the last slide here is just an image of a para, a sphinx head of a para with the name's headdress on. And this is all Nubian. I give you this. There is so much more about this great civilization, and we're going to be digging and studying more. And I just want to say, uh, if I uh, 
best way. Unity is always our aim. Yeah. And victory is our destiny. Thank you. Sure. You can do better than that. Put your hands together. I'm going to let that catch that sample. All right. We got time for some questions and answers? Just to um, facilitate properly, it's called question <laughs> and answer. Your role is to give the question, not the soliloquy, not the dissertation. And although I know we've all been through something, not even your testimony, if you can just keep it brief for the benefit of everybody, it'd be much appreciated. Question and answer time. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. When they moved the temples from Nubia to York and wherever else, was it stone by stone or did, did it, the whole thing? Or how did they, 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 they took it, uh, for example, the Temple of Dendur in uh, the New York Metropolitan Museum of Art, the, it took them about three years to take it piece, piece by piece, block stone by stone. Wow. And they, they, what they do, put a number on the stone. And then when they, when they, when they yeah, they, they reassembled it when they brought it to New York. And they did most of them like that, but, but there, there are still uh, smaller temples and shrines that are under the lake that they were not able to save them all. And, and, and get to look at this, and really, the, the, the big outcry uh, to save them when they said they were going to build a Aswan High Dam was uh, from Europe. It, it was not even from uh, the African governments, because of course, remember in 1970, many of them were not free and independent, and then the, 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 the Nubian people didn't have much political power. So the, 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 the Arab government of, of Egypt and Sudan could do basically whatever they will. And what they basically did was, let's say, wipe out the Nubian culture. And they did manage to save some because at the UNESCO and other people said, wait a minute, you can't do this. You're wiping out a whole civilization. You, are y'all crazy? What is going on? And so they recovered a lot. And there is a, uh, there is a Nubian museum in the city of Aswan. You can go see that. Uh, it's uh, the Egyptian government just cut the funding on that recently, though. Mm -hmm. But uh, but it is still very very powerful. And the second place, by the way, for Nubian uh, artifacts is in Boston. Mm -hmm. You go to the Boston Museum. They have the, the largest collection of Nubian art in, in outside uh, of Egypt. I mean, in Sudan. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Um, I have a problem with the word sub-Saharan. Can you tell me? Exactly yeah, I, did I use that word? No. no. I, didn't, no. I never use that word. I agree with you. We're, we're, yeah, you never use the word sub-Saharan. That don't make, make any sense anyway. There's no Africa uh, south of the Sahara. The, the Sahara is Africa. I mean, what, what is that talking about? I have never understood that. And not only, as I told people, Africans uh, live in the Sahara in many places. And uh, I just saw Africans uh, last week uh, riding camels and racing camels. So uh, Africans cross the desert in ca on camels. So it's not a, no, it's not a, it, there's no such thing as sub-Saharan. That, that word was created again by, that's what I told you about, you have to look at racism. Mm -hmm. Every interpretation yeah. is race. Yeah. It, the Europeans are very slick. There, there's no such thing as sub-Saharan Africa. I mean, basically uh, all of Africa is Africa. I mean, you know, I mean, you know that 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 that's crazy. You know, it's like uh, it's like saying um, there's a, there's there's a Europe that is uh, you could say it's south of the Alps or something like that. But uh, but but when you look at it, you, it's all Europe. I mean, it, it's all the desert is Africa. So you're right. Don't use the word sub sub Saharan Africa. Just use Africa. If you want to name a country, name it Chad or. Niger or Morocco, Algeria, name and country. But they're trying to separate the Nile Valley civilizations away from the rest of the continent, which is also stupid, but anyway. Yes, please. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I got into a debate the other day with some Negroes. And I, was, <laughs> yeah. I, was, I was telling them that Europe is not a continent. Right. And I opened up the map right. and I showed them it's on the continent of Asia. Yeah. And they couldn't see it. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, it's, Maybe the level of brainwashing has gone up another yeah, notch. Yeah, yeah. You know, just and, and that other thing you had mentioned about Amun, it's in the Bible in Revelation three thirteen. Yeah. And Amun is 
clearly announced. Yeah. They tell you you're saying amen, which means so be it. Right. But ominous clearly announced. It sure is. Yeah, I remember that. I remember reading that. And you're perfectly correct about Europe. I mean, uh, Europe is a created uh, designation. And, and it is uh, it's not, normally if you look up definition of continent, it is almost, you know, you, it's, it's surrounded by water. But, you know, so you say Australia is a continent. I mean, uh, North America, South America. I mean, some of them, you know, it gets fuzz a little bit. I mean, Africa. Is, but when you get to Europe, you, you're really talking about, Euro, you could say Eurasia, if you make that a continent. But Europe wanted to separate itself from Asia, you see. But uh, and be something unique. They always like to do that. That's Europe, you know. That's the, as I call it, the Donald Trump syndrome. You know, it's like you know, we 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 different, you know, and so we would not like other humans, and that's correct in terms of the way they have treated the world. That's right. But uh, but but this is a very strange thing. So don't don't be don't be surprised that they make a defense of Europe. What they're making a defense of mainly is Christianity. And this came out with the Battle of Poitiers. Uh, the Battle of Poitiers, uh, and when uh, Charles, uh, Charles Martel um, sort of rallied the European uh, 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 ethnic groups together to fight against the Moors. And that's when they sort of came with an identity that they were different from the rest of the people on the Eurasian continent. I'm sorry, there was another question. Yes, sir. Yes, um, I used to um, listen to uh, Dr. Ben. And uh, that deals with the napkin, and, and he said that um, in, in one lecture that um, the oldest deity that was worshipped was not male nor a god, but a female. Would you concur? Uh, I'm I I I'm trying to think of the he didn't give the name of the deity. Well, no. Here's what I could say. I I could say this that. In, in, in Africa, in Africa, most uh, of the concepts of deity do not have a masculine or feminine aspects to him. So, you, so, so he's probably correct in that sense, but I thought that maybe there was a name that he, he had. I mean, because it's, it's really about energy. It's basically about energy. Uh, but there are some elements that, that demonstrate uh, masculinity and some that demonstrate femininity. Uh, you can see that in some senses. You see, uh, particularly when, when you when you hear the, the the notion of the creation, where the creation was uh, created by semen, for example, which is in a, in a male sense. But 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 for the most part, not just in ancient Kemet, but throughout the continent of Africa, uh, th this notion of he and she does not appear in the same way as it does in Western languages. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, please. Could you correct me if I'm wrong, please? On the Memphite stone, the story of creation, 5,000 BC, and that, and I know these are not the conventional mm -hmm. um, titles of Isis and Osiris and Horus. Mm -hmm. I always tell my students that that was the story where the Christ story mm -hmm. was taken from. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the, the Christ story it just seems to me logical that it was taken from the ancient creation story of Kemet. I mean, uh, I, I'm not sure I can't like point to where it went over into that, but there's so many things that are similar that you get, you have to say that the 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 ancient story was older. I I wouldn't I don't know about the five thousand year um, story for the Memphite uh, stone. Uh, uh, theology, but it, it's probably older than that, but in terms of historical record, it has to start around 32, 3400 BC, because that's when writing starts. Otherwise, we don't know. We, we can say it must have been older than when writing started, but we don't know anything older than what is written. That, that's, the, that's the point. But, but, uh, but, this, but certainly when you see here the story of um, uh, the Madonna and the child, it sounds very much like Oset and Heru, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or, or Horus. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Um, I don't know if you remember, but a few years back in Mali, there was a situation again with um, Islamic uh, table. They were, I think, they were burning and pillaging uh, 
library yes. in Timbuktu. And I wanted to ask you, how can we, in terms of this conversation, preserving our history, seeing that it's wiped out, how can we try to um, leverage, you know, keep pre keeping this information that we have, like in Timbuktu, all of the library, the, the uh, Islamic groups were just going through and with, with no repercussion at all. I don't even know what happened to all of these books and all of this information that we have lost. How can we try to love it? It seems like the Europeans, and again, there could be some racial undertones in their in their agenda behind that. We don't know, taking these temples and bringing them to Europe, for example. In the preservation of that, there may be other things going on. But is that something we need to consider? Because in, in, in a lot of Africa, you have Arabs that are in charge of the governments who uh, don't care about this information and in fact have a concerted effort possibly to erase this because it doesn't align with the religious um, teachings that, that they practice. Mm -hmm. So what can we do to help? You, you've raised a very important question and it is a significant question because after all, I mean, uh, the whole meaning in Nigeria, Boko Haram, is against any kind of knowledge and preservation of knowledge. Only knowledge is the Quran. Mm -hmm. So that's a very scary notion when it comes to our history. And that's world why, history. huh? I, I world history. Know. Yeah, but, but when you think of it, I I'm always sort of start with Africa because I'm, I'm, I'm worried, and Mali, you start with Mali is a good example. I had a student from Mali who was uh, regretting the fact that in Mali, almost no material culture exists. You see, because basically Islam wipes out all your culture because these are images, these stone sculptures, and many of the big African art dealers are from Muslim nations in Africa. And that's because they don't care about them as part of their ancestors. There's not an ancestral heritage. They don't necessarily, I mean, my, my I used to, uh, be engaged in purchasing African art many years ago, and my dealer was from Guinea, and he was Muslim, and he that he just it was business for him. It had nothing to do with what I'm I'm buying because I want to you know the things you see even in here on the wall. These these are some valuable things that they were they were purchased from people sometimes who didn't really care because they just was given away. So here's what we can do. We can honor our ancestors and our traditions, and we can write about the things that we see and know. We have to write, we, if we don't preserve them even in their materiality, we can preserve them in a historical context. We have to do this, we have to be, because otherwise how do you teach your children that you, at one time you did something, you know? You, at one time you were the leaders in engineering. You, you, you built pyramids. You know, at one time, you, you did this, your people did this. How do you do this in an oppressive society that doesn't want you to express anything about where you came from? So you must honor your ancestors, even in your homes. You must have your shrines, and you must, you know, respect and, and, and have this sense. Um, yeah, I'm very sad about the Timbuktu thing, but they, some of the books were preserved, by the way. There was a big story about one person who hid many of the books. Mm -hmm. And uh, and, many, and the people who hid some of the books, we have to remember, these people are Muslim too. Mm -hmm. they, they, because most of the people in Mali are Muslims, even the ones who, who are the ones who are trying to save the books are Muslim, as well as the ones who are trying to destroy them. And in Nigeria, of course, you have the same philosophy. And that's why in the northern part of Nigeria, almost no African, no traces of African art or culture. Wiped out, totally wiped out. After, you know, four or five hundred years of, uh, of Islam, basically, which tells you that the images are wrong, they're, you know, you shouldn't have any images, graven images of anything and so on. So everybody else, the Greeks still have their sculpture from you know, 200 BC, and our sculptures and all that stuff, uh, they say we have no culture because we don't have any evidence of it. But it's all wiped out. And it's because, again, uh, fanaticism and this whole notion that somehow you get to be pure by getting rid of the materiality that has been created by, your, by the genius of your ancestors. I, I, I reject that. Yes, in the back. 
What are the the primary designations between the term Kemet and Nubia? Well, the the uh, between Kemet and Nubia is sometimes uh, they flow right into each other. This is why, for example, the city of Aswan used to be called the um, the uh, one of the limits of uh, of Nubia to the north. But now some people are saying the limit of Nubia to the north could go all the way up to Kamombo in 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 Egypt. So. Uh, which which make Egypt much shorter, uh, Kemet much shorter. You see, so uh, I think they they just flow across the border. They just, borders change of thousands of years. The borders have changed, and sometimes you know it's it's Waset for example. Waset is um, is north of Aswan, and Waset was uh, was a, the chief capital along with Napata for uh, for the rulers of uh, several dynasties. Yeah. Okay, w one last question, yes. I actually have two. Questions. Okay, questions. sure. One was, I mean, very quick, I, I think. Sure. One was, um, when was the dam built that flooded the area in... in uh, 19, the, 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 the Aswan High Dam was 1970. 1964. 1964. 1964. Okay. Yeah. And also, um, Moses, yes. Sir, yes. Um, you were saying that he had so many battles. Yes. What was he battling? He was battling mainly the Syrians, <laughs> the Hittites. And um, he, he, he fought uh, uh, many battles, and also Nubia as well. He fought Nubia as well. So he, he fought, uh, he, f uh, he extended the boundaries of Kemet um, deep into uh, 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 Asia uh, and, uh, and also with Nubia. Okay, thank mm. you. You're welcome. Okay, brothers and sisters, right. thank you. Thank you all so much again. Um, What's the next date? I want to make sure I announce it properly. Um, oh, that's me. <laughs> I feel like that young sister.